Right, and I'm going to share my screen. Can someone confirm whether you can see the shared screen? Okay, thank you. Um, so today we have this workshop, our guide for targeted um, maximum likelihood estimation in medical research. Um, I am Ehsan Purim. Uh, I am from University of British Columbia. I'm, I'm from the School of Population and Public Health. Um, and my research area is generally speaking, machine learning, causal inference. Um, and since I have an interest in both machine learning and causal inference, this TMLE or the targeted maximum likelihood estimation is actually very relevant for my research. Um, we also have Hannah. Uh, she is a graduate student in my lab. Hannah, do you want to introduce your, yourself? Uh, sure, yeah. I've just completed my first year of my MSc uh, here at UBC uh, in population and public health. And so, yeah, I've been focusing on this TMLE recently in my research. Um, and yeah. Definitely interesting field. Right, so um, in terms of today's workshop, um, let me just um, go through the goals first. In today's workshop, what we will do is we will try to get some introductory explanations or, or ideas about the targeted maximum likelihood estimation but before we go there, we will need to give some explanation of some of the relevant methods because TMLE is built on some of the other methods that are already available. Uh, these methods are G computation or a and uh, inverse probability of weighting. Um, in this workshop, what we will do, we'll start with the G computation, then we'll introduce inverse probability weighting, then we will transition into the targeted maximum likelihood estimation and show the steps. And after we show all of the steps, we will also introduce some of the software packages that are already out there that can help you implement this method. In terms of the analysis, we are simply going to use one particular epidemiologic data uh, to explain all of these concepts. Um, and we are not really going to focus on theory. We are just going to focus more on the implementation side. So the philosophy of this workshop is basically code for first philosophy where uh, we will just show the codes and show the implementation details and do the analysis um, of a real data set using those codes. All of these codes that I have used to generate the results are already available in this particular um, workshop material. For those who have joined later, I am pasting the link for the workshop materials again. All right, so in terms of the prerequisites, um, generally um, I'm expecting that you have a basic understanding of the R language, have some general understanding of the multiple uh, linear regression, um, if you have some familiarity with machine learning and some of the epidemiologic concepts that will be helpful, but those are not required. I'm going to explain them in brief. Um, even though this is a workshop on causal inference, I'm not really expecting anybody to have a deep understanding of causal inference or st advanced statistical methods. All right, so this is the first workshop that we are delivering on this particular topic. Um, so, uh, this is the first version of this document. Obviously, if you can spot any error or if you have any comments about this document, please feel free to reach out. Um, you can go to my website just by clicking here and you can email me uh, from, from there. Um, and um, if you like this tutorial and if you want to cite this tutorial somewhere, uh, here is how you can cite. So before I move on to the chapter one, I just wanted to get a sense of where the participants are coming from. Um, would it be okay for the participants to just type in your, um, from where you are coming from, which institute or which city you are coming from in the 
chat box. University of Colorado, mm -hmm. Chicago, all right. Oh, I, I see someone from Ottawa, Australia, okay. Uh, New York, Netherlands, okay. All right. Philadelphia, South Africa, all right. All right, so even if some someone is late, that's probably not a big deal in the sense that we are recording this session um, and um, we should be able to um, post this recording after the event so that you can review the materials if you want to, or if someone is not joining live, they can also view the materials. Um, just let me check one thing. So I, I see the recording button is on, so should not be a big deal uh, if someone is joining late. Um, for those who have maybe joined late and have not seen the materials yet, um, here is the material. Um, so today um, we are going to use some of these um, signs um so can you just mention that whether you can see the chapter one that i'm showing right now yes okay all right so let me just start with the chapter one and and then we, we will uh, go on with the rest of the chapters so my general plan is we have three hours uh, but we do not necessarily have to use the full, full three hours. Um, so what we will do is we have in total eight chapters um, and within these three hours um, or less, we will try to cover all of these chapters. Um, and after I cover each of these chapters, I will pause for questions from the audience. And if there is any question I can try to answer, or if you, do not want to wait and uh, want to go ahead and ask the question, you can always type the question in the chat box. And then um, at the end of the chapter, I will pause and try to read the questions and try to answer those questions uh, one by one. All right, so let us begin. So in this particular workshop, what we are doing is we are going to use this um, right heart catheterization data set. Um, and this particular data set is openly available in the Vanderbilt uh, Biostatistics um, website. Um, and in this particular data set, what is happening is um, they have a procedure called right heart catheterization, which is basically a monitoring device for measurement of cardiac functions. And um, in 1996, uh, Connors uh, and, and uh, colleagues uh, has published a article in JAMA uh, where they have examined the association of the right heart catheterization use um, and a number of health related outcomes. And one of those health related outcomes was length of stay, which was measured in a continuous scale. So in our workshop today, what we are going to do, we are going to simply focus on the relationship between RHC use and the um, length of stay as an outcome. So we are going to assess the relationship between these two with the understanding that we also have a number of adjustment variables. So in this workshop, what we will try to do is we'll try to adjust the adjustment variables to get um, a better estimate of the RHC use on the length of stay uh, in the hospital. All right, so all of these codes that you are seeing, all of these analyses that uh, I have done, all of these codes associated with those analyses are visible here. If you want, you can um, hide the codes if these codes um, get annoyed, <laughs> annoying to you. Uh, but generally speaking, I will show the codes with the understanding that you understand R uh, and show all of these uh, reproducible codes. So in the first step, what we are doing is that after downloading the data, I'm just going to prepare the 
analytic data so that I can use this data for my analysis. So in this particular step, what I'm basically doing, I'm uh, recording um, and restructuring some of these uh, data, uh, data so that I can get a uh, analytic version of the data. And I will be using this analytic version of the data for the rest of this workshop. For this workshop, um, there are three notations that I'm going to repeatedly use. The first notation is the exposure status, which is den denoted by A. So in this particular workshop uh, or in this particular example, RHC use is our A variable or the exposure status. Then we have the outcome or Y, uh, which is the length of stay in hospital in our particular example. And we have a number of adjustment variables or covariates, uh, which is going to be denoted by L, and we are going to show the uh, covariates uh, below. So in this particular data set, we have 49 covariates, which is like disease category, cancer, cardiovascular event, um, income, uh, body weight, and stuff like that. So in total, we have 49 covariates. Um, so that makes 51 variables because one variable is for the exposure status, one variable for the outcome status, and one very uh, and 49 variables for the covariates or these L variables. All right. So if you go to this Connors paper, by the way, if you if you just click on this link and you will it will take you to the reference and you can download the Connors paper for free from the research gate. And if you download that paper, you will see there is a table one in that paper. So in here, what I have done is I have basically created the table one from there using the create table one package using some of the important demographic and uh, disease variables that we have in that data set. And if you look at the data set, you will see um, there are about more than 2000 subjects who are treated with RHC and there were more than 3,500 uh, observations or subjects who were treat not treated with um, the RHC variable. And in a general sense, if you say, for example, look at the age distribution in both of these categories, generally speaking, the age distribution in terms of these uh, proportions that you see in this parenthesis, they generally look very similar. So that kind of gives you a sense that the data set that we are dealing with um, are mostly balanced, uh, but we'll, we'll say more about that a bit later. All right, so we also looked at the length of stay variable and we tried to compare the numbers with the papers. We can see um, in terms of the length of variables, uh, when we take the mean for the people who took the RHC variable, uh, it was 24.86. Um, and if we also take the mean of the length of stay for those who did not take the RHC, um, the mean was 19.53. Interestingly enough, uh, when we looked at the um, paper, the numbers were slightly different. Um, so I, I don't know whether the data was later somehow manipulated or there was another variable uh, called ICU versus hospital, whether that variable was supposed to be there, um, we don't know. But generally speaking, I'm going to work with this particular data set uh, where the mean is um, 19 versus 24 uh, for the outcome under both of the exposure groups. I also have calculated the medians and the medians are also slightly different. In the papers, they have reported the medians to be 13 and 17, but when we calculated the medians, they were 12 and 16, so slightly different. Um, I'm just saying it just so you know that we are dealing with a slightly different data set so, so that we can manage our expectation about how closely we can uh, match the results. All right. So in terms of finding out how useful RHC is, we can basically run a 
regression um, without even adjusting any other variable. Let's just find the crude analysis results first. And in that crude analysis results, we can see that we are simply running a linear regression model where Y is the outcome and A is the um, exposure variable. And when we run the regression, we get a coefficient of 5.3 with a reported confidence interval, right? And now we, what we do is we basically uh, use the same regression, but now we are adding all of these 49 baseline confounders that we have, and we again run the regression. Then um, this is the outcome regression that we are running where we have Y as the outcome, A is the exposure variable, but we also have this 49 covariates. Then we can see the coefficient of A or the RHC use is turning into 2.9. So previously when we did the crude analysis, the coefficient was 5.3. But after adjusting, we are getting the coefficient of 2.9. So obviously we are seeing some change when we're adjusting for the uh, 49 variables we have. All right. So what is the um, what is the thing that you everybody should do when they do regression analysis? They should check the regression diagnostics, right? So we check the regression diagnostics. So this is a plot where um, you can see this is a plot for residuals versus the fitted values. Obviously there is some pattern showing, uh, whereas in the diagnostic plots, we generally expect that there will not be any visible pattern, right? So the data sets um, or the data points in this plot should be as random as possible, which is obviously not the case for this particular regression. We again check the QQ plot uh, deviated from uh, normality to some extent. We again check the studentized version of the version of the residual versus the fitted values. Again, there is some pattern that we can see. Um, there are some other plots. So generally speaking, when we ran the multiple linear regression, the diagnostics did not look so good. All right. So what we are trying to do is we are just trying to get a sense of what is the treatment effect estimate, right? Um, or, or whether there was any difference between the uh, RHC use versus non RHC use, uh, whether there was any difference. So in Connor's paper, they have done a propensity score matched analysis. Um, just a short note for this workshop is that we are not going to cover propensity score analysis in detail for this particular workshop because for TMLE, we basically need G competition and inverse probability weighting. So propensity score is not on the top of our list, but for those who are more interested to know about propensity score matching, there is another workshop that I have, it's called Understanding Propensity Score Matching. You can check out the materials from the, for the, that workshop in here. Also, I have a YouTube video on the video recording for that workshop in another conference. So you can feel free to, after this workshop, you can feel free to take a look at that. So in this workshop, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to briefly talk about what is, uh, what is it that this Connors paper have done? And we are trying to just going to re replicate uh, whether we can get the similar results or not. So to get the propensity score estimates, what we generally do, we basically try to fit the exposure model first. Um, and in here we have fitted the exposure model to get the propensity score. And the fitted value from that exposure model is basically our propensity scores. So using the match it package, we simply run the propensity score analysis and the diagnostics for propensity score analysis is very easy to check. You simply plot the propensity scores for the treated versus untreated. So in here, uh, treatment equal to one means RHC use, treatment equal to zero means non RHC use, or there, is, there was no RHC use. So in the unadjusted sample, when there was no propensity score matching, you can see the distribution of the propensity score were different. But when we do the propensity score matching, this was a one-to-one -one matching. We can see the distributions are very similar. So 
the diagnostic plots for the propensity scores are much easier uh, to check compared to the di diagnostic plot for a regression. Uh, so this is a very big table where they are showing a lot of numbers, but you just take a look at whether how many of them were balanced and how many of them were not balanced. And you can see uh, none of the covariates were unbalanced. So all of the covariates that we had in this propensity score is going to be uh, balanced. And you can see this better in a plot. This is called love plot. When you run this love plot, um, you can basically see the difference between the unadjusted uh, standardized mean difference uh, versus the uh, propensity score matched uh, pro uh, standardized mean differences. So these blue ones are coming from the propensity score matching. Uh, and you can see none of them are going above or below the 0.1 cut point. Um, and so we are happy with the matching. So once we are happy with the matching, we can simply check the cross-tabulated version of uh, what is the mean of the no RHCUs and what is the mean of the RHCUs. And we can do a test to see whether they were different. And by this test, it shows that it is different. Interestingly enough, if you go back and look at the Connors paper, the Connors paper found um, a different p-value. Um, and this is not unexpected when you are using a one-to-one -one propensity score matching, where there is a lot of uh, variability uh, and uh, matching is basically done uh, randomly um, to some extent. Um, and there was some difference between the analysis that Connors have done versus what analysis I have done because I have used a caliper option here. So that is why that is maybe one reason why we are seeing a slightly different result. Anyway, so this is uh, just by checking the mean of the outcome in the exposed versus unexposed group. We can also try to estimate the treatment effect just by using a regression. We do not have to adjust for any other baseline confounders or covariates anymore because we have already matched the data in the propensity score matched data. We can get a treatment effect estimate of three point something, right? So obviously this is not the core part of the workshop, but I just wanted to show you that this is the coefficient that we are getting from the propensity score matching. So there were other papers that have used this same RHC data, say for example, this Keeley and Small paper um, that was published this year uh, in the American Statistician, they have also estimated the treatment effect and their point estimate uh, was slightly different that, than ours. Their point estimate was two, whereas our point estimate from the propensity score matching was three. But they were using a slightly different method that, and that method's name is um, targeted maximum likelihood estimation using super learner. So we are just going to you learn in this workshop how to use this targeted maximum likelihood estimation uh, method using the super learner. At the end of this page, you can see some of these relevant messages. Before I move on to the G competition or the next chapter, um, I just wanted to ask whether there is any question from any of you. You can either type in the chat or I don't know whether you can unmute yourself. All right. So, um, for the propensity score matching, there are many different ways you can do the matching. In this particular workshop, um, I have showed uh, a one-to-one -one matching, but obviously there is um, variable matching that is also available. Um, you can also do optimal matching um, that will try to uh, take more uh, uh, observations from both sides, from the treated and untreated um, to get a better estimate. So obviously, as you can imagine, one-to-one -one matching is also reducing your data set to a larger extent. And um, many people might feel not comfortable with that. So they usually prefer to use a higher ratio. What, what is the recommended ratio? That is a hard question to ask because that kind of depends on data to data. But generally speaking, um, as high as possible, uh, given the context of your data is more encouraged. All right, so 
just to give a high level view of the difference in propensity score matching and TMLE is that in the propensity score matching, we're basically focusing on the exposure modeling, right? So if you go back to the propensity score modeling approach, you can see here uh, in building the propensity scores, what, what I'm doing is I am using this A as the exposure variable. And I will go into more detail when I talk about this inverse probability of weighting in the chapter four. But generally speaking, in the propensity score matching, we are focusing more on the exposure modeling. Uh, but in the uh, TMLE, what we do is we first fit a G computation model, and then we use the propensity score to recalibrate our model. So we are going to talk more about that in the later chapters. All right, so if there is no other question, let me move on to the next chapter, which is going to be our first step towards this targeted maximum likelihood estimate. Um, and to explain some of these ideas, I, I will first reduce the data set to some extent so that I can fit the whole data set into one table and explain the ideas that I want to explain. So just a recap of the ideas, um, what we have is we have um, approximately uh, 5,700 subjects. We have one outcome variable length of stay, one exposure variable RHC status or RHCUs, and we have 49 covariates. Some of them are demographic variables, some of them are clinical variables. So this is the data set we're going to continue to use. So just so that I can explain my ideas in here, um, instead of using uh, 5,700 subjects, I'm just focusing on six subjects. And in these six subjects, you can see four of them are female and two of them are male. And um, also we have a lot of covariates, right? So we do not really want to spend a lot of time at the beginning in the covariates. So let us just focus on only one covariate six in this particular data set. So this is a very small data set consisting only with six subjects. So we are going to explain some of, introduce some of these new notations that we are going to use in this G computation chapter. So previously we have all, already talked about A being the exposure status, Y being the outcome status. Now we introduce two new um, notations. The first notation is Y and in parenthesis A equal to one. That means potential outcome when um, the subject was exposed. So what does it mean in our particular example? It means that length of stay was our outcome, right? So it means Y in parenthesis A equal to one means that the length of stay when RHC was used by a patient. And similarly, Y A equal to zero means the potential outcome uh, when not exposed. That means that length of stay when RHC is not used. Um, so to make the ideas a bit more concrete, I'm just going to show the data set. But um, just to recap, we have 49 covariates and we have we we had this format of the data. We had L uh, column, we had A column with the RHC status, and we had the Y column with the length of stay, where length of stay was a continuous variable. Uh, a was a binary variable and sex was also a binary variable in this particular data. So from this formulation of the data, what we are going to do, we are simply going to convert this Y into this uh, Y equal to one and Y equal to zero formulation. So that means that we are simply uh, splitting this Y column into two different columns. Outcome when exposure was applied, outcome when exposure was not applied. So what does that look like in our data set? So we <laughs> restructured the data, do not uh, pay too much attention to the code, uh, but this uh, at paying attention to this table would, would just uh, be sufficient. What you can see in this original data, um, we had the first subject was a male subject who was not exposed to the RHC treatment and the length of stay uh, was nine days, right? So if we go back to our new formulation data, we can see that this nine 
observation or nine days is moved towards uh, y when a equal to zero, right? And we do the same for anybody who did not take RHC. So we move this uh, observation here and we move this observation here. The seven observation uh, or seven days is moved to um, y in parenthesis a equal to zero. Similarly, for those who uh, whose um, exposure status was one, you can simply get the outcome of 45 days when that subject was um, exposed into a different column, y a equal to one, right? So if you wanted to calculate the treatment effect estimate out of this particular table, what you would do is basically you would uh, take an average of all of the observed values under y a equal to one, which is 36, and you will again take a mean of all of the observed values under y a equal to zero, which is 18. And if you subtract these two, you can get a treatment effect of 18. One important part of uh, point of this table is that you cannot calculate the treatment effect estimate uh, by subtracting uh, these two columns observation because only one observation of outcome is observed in the data set. You cannot have the same subject who has the exposure and not has the exposure, right? So that is why we often call these type of notations as counterfactual notations because we cannot observe both. So this is counter to factual. So that is why this is called a counterfactual notation. And in this, when we only use the observed, observed data, we cannot calculate the treatment effect for each of the individuals, but we can obviously calculate a treatment effect estimate when we take averages of the observed values under each of these columns, right? So think of this, if you, if you have this problem of, obviously you can take the mean of these observed values, but there are some, some of these cells of these uh, column that are unobserved, right? So one thing that you can do is you can treat this problem as a missing data problem. And you can try to impute the values uh, so that you can get the treatment effect estimate for each of these individuals, right? So that is what we are doing um, in this particular table where I simply imputed this value 36, which is the mean of the observed values into all of these uh, cells where we did not observe any values. I also do the same for the un, un, um, unexposed. Uh, we can see the 18 was the mean outcome. And I simply impute these 18 values in all of these cases. And then what is wonderful about this is that I can estimate the treatment effect in the individual level. So I can try to get a treatment effect estimate for each of these participants. Okay, so is that the best we can do? We can just impute the mean. Is there anything else that we could do? Uh, notice that we had, say, for example, male and female uh, subjects, and it is certainly possible that uh, the sex variable is a confounder variable. So in that case, if you just impute these uh, mean values, that would not necessarily uh, get rid of confounding in any sense. So in that case, what would be a better method is to um, get the mean values for male participants um, when they were treated and get the mean values for the female participants when they were treated. And we simply impute um, the values for male and female separately. So two was the mean for male and 52.5 was the mean for female. So if we have a participant who is male, we are simply going to impute this two in here. But if we have a female participant, uh, we simply impute the uh, mean for the um, observed uh, female participants outcomes uh, mean. Uh, so that is why we are basically imputing here. Uh, this is obviously a one step better approach than just imputing an overall mean. And obviously we can do the same for when uh, y um, in parenthesis a equal to zero, we can do the same for them and we can still calculate the treatment effect estimate. The issue here is that we will now have two different treatment effect estimate, but we can simply take an average of them to get the average treatment effect. 
All right. So now that I have explained that when you take into consideration of one confounder, how, how do you uh, improve your imputation values? Um, you can imagine that we have other covariates in our analysis and some of them could be confounders. Say for example, we could have age, income, race, disease categories, each of these variables as confounders. And if we wanted to do the imputation in this way, that, that would really take a long, long time. And also in some cells, we might not even have a uh, person to represent the mean. So it does not necessarily always solve the imputation problem, but we have a better tool uh, that we could use. Um, and that tool is regression because regression is basically a generalized method to take um, conditional mean on many covariates, right? So instead of just using this one by one um, um, gender specific means, we can basically uh, build a regression function. And based on that regression function, we can try to impute um, wh whatever we think are so should be the outcome under the exposed, whatever should be the outcome under not exposed. Um, so in this particular setting, I, I hope I was able to motivate you to understand why it is necessary for me to use the regression mean, because we have a lot of covariates here that we're dealing with. See, we, are, we have a lot of covariates so basically what we are doing is we are basically building a regression function where we have observed y, basically the original y that was merged together. We have the exposure variable and then we have all of these baseline confounders. And once we have that formula, we just fit the linear regression and we find out all of these coefficients. Um, and using this regression fit, uh, we can try to obtain uh, what would be the observed outcome if everyone was treated. So basically what I do in the original data set, I replace um, the observed A status or the exposure status to RHC for every participants. And then um, I try to use that new data in the prediction model to get the predicted outcome for uh, as if everybody was treated. Uh, so this is the as if uh, type of concept. That's why this is coming from the counterfactual notation. And when we you try to see the uh, mean of the outcome, who if everybody was treated, the mean of the outcome was uh, slightly over 20. We can again do the same, but this time, uh, and also we can uh, definitely put all of these numbers in a table and we can see all of these people are under treatment. Um, and this is a, a as if type of statement. So in here we have the original RHC status. That is not what we are using. We are using what if everybody was treated and then this would be the outcome, right? And similarly, we can do the same for uh, what if everybody was untreated, what would be the outcome then? And then we can estimate the mean of the predicted values and we can get an estimate, uh, mean estimate of 20. And we can put all of these numbers in the table again uh, when nobody was treated. And basically now we have this problem that um, under this setup, we have all of these observations that were predicted from that regression where everybody was treated and in here we have everybody who was untreated same from the same regression we are just changing the y a column if we are changing the a column we are just getting these predictions and if we subtract each of these values we are getting treatment effect for everybody equal to 2.9 basically everybody is using the same regression uh, to get the estimate so the process that we went through is basically known as the G competition, but I, I have shown the steps, but I have not explicitly said what are the steps. So let me show you what are the steps. Uh, before that, let me just explain that in a general type of association measure uh, analysis, what we do is we try to get the persons who are exposed versus we try to get, get the persons who are unexposed and we try to get a difference between these two. Uh, 
But when we are using this decomposition formula, what we are trying to get is what if everybody was treated versus what if everybody was untreated. And then we try to get, get the contrast of that, those two means. So basically for the G competition, what we are doing is we are basically fitting a regression first. This is the first step. The second step is we are basically replacing our observed A values with one. All of the observed A column would be one and we are trying to get the prediction. Again, we are trying to uh, replace our original A uh, to A equal to zero. Uh, that means no RHC and we try to get the uh, predicted outcome. And once we get these two predicted outcomes, we basically uh, find the mean of those and take a difference. And that is how we get the treatment effect estimate. So, okay, let me, we, we were so far working with only six observations. So let me just see how it works in all of these observations, right? So in this setting, you can see uh, what I'm doing. Basically, I'm uh, fitting the regression where Y is the outcome and A and L are the um, input variables. And once we fit the regression, we generally call it a Q regression and we will see this later as well. And once we have this regression fit, we basically uh, use a new data. And in this new data, what we do is we impute all A equal to one and we get a prediction. And then we do the same, uh, but we then impute A equal to zero and we get the predicted outcome. And then we get the um, mean of them and take the difference and that will give us the treatment effect estimate. So in our particular case, when we used all of this data set, we got the mean estimate of 2.9. But if you look at the standard deviation, the standard deviation would be very close to zero because there was no variability. Remember in the data set, when we observed all of these uh, treatment effects, everybody was 2.9. So there was no variability. So even though in the G competition method, we can estimate the treatment effect estimate, which is going to be 2.9 in our example, but we do not necessarily get a good estimate for the uh, variance. See, all of these numbers are very close together here. Uh, to 2.9. So if you want to really get a confidence interval for the treatment effect estimate, um, then we generally run a bootstrap to get the confidence interval. And when we run the bootstrap, we basically um, see uh, there is some variability in the estimate and in the bootstrap confidence interval, you can then see uh, when you are getting the bootstrap estimate using the normality assumption, you can get a, a confidence interval of 1.3 to 4. And when you run a percentile based bootstrap estimate, you can get 1.5 to 4.5. Obviously, as you can remember, uh, the, the data was not really uh, that different from normality maybe. So that's why the results are somewhat similar when you are using the normality and percentile based estimates. Um, so we will probably take a break uh, for about um, 10 minutes, but before that, if there is any question, I can try to answer before the break about G competition. I think there's two questions in the chat. Okay. So first question is, um, how robust are these methods against data uh, not missing at random? Um, so as you know, in this particular setting, we, we are relying on the model specification and we are hoping that our model specification is correct. Say for example, what do I mean by model specification? In this particular step, say for example, when we are fitting the first step of the G competition, we are assuming a model, right? And when, when we are assuming a model, we are assuming that we have specified our model correctly. But if we, we fail to do that, if we 
uh, fail to assume that our model is correctly specified, obviously the results are going to be uh, sensitive um, to um, that misspecification. And, and that is basically one of the basis for our next chapter. So thank you for that question. Um, the next question is, what are the side effects if the linear model assumptions are not met when we are predicting exposure effect for everyone? Basically the same idea. So everybody is uh, picking on this uh, same concept that if, what if this model is wrong, then uh, how can we believe our predicted outcomes based on which we are basically getting the treatment effect estimate. The answer is if this model is wrong, we cannot really rely too much on the uh, predicted values on, we cannot believe too much about the treatment effect estimate that we get out of uh, this G computation. And that is basically one of the motivation why we are moving on to the machine learning methods uh, when we are fitting this G computation. And I'm going to cover that in the next chapter. Um, so let us take, okay. So is there a problem regarding overfitting? It seems the predictions at the model are not in whole data set. Yes, <laughs> yes, this, this is a very relevant question and uh, a very good segue for the next chapter. In this next chapter, we are going to talk about overfitting as well. Um, so thank you for that question. Is there any other question? If not, let us meet in 10 minutes. Uh, so in, in my Pacific time, I, it shows 12.48 now. Um, so in 12.58, uh, uh, we'll come back and start from the uh, chapter three then. Thank you.
Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, let me share my screen first. All right, so basically let me give an overview of um, what we have covered so far. At first we have talked about the RHC dataset and we have showed some initial propensity score estimates from that data analysis. And then we have um, introduced the G computation methods and we have explained the steps that are required for the G computation. And then we have explained that um, to get the treatment effect estimate, G computation is fine, but for getting the confidence interval, you need uh, some procedure like bootstrap to get the uh, proper confidence interval. Um, so now we are going to start with our next chapter, which is the G computation using the machine learning methods. So as from some of the last um, question answers, uh, you can imagine that G computation is a method that is highly de dependent on the parametric assumptions that we are making or the model that we are fitting based on which we are doing this prediction. So this model, model is the core of everything. So getting the model correct is very important for G computation. But one of the problem with uh, parametric regression is that you as an analyst will exactly have to know what is the um, confounder, what are the interactions, what type of polynomials you have to use and stuff like that. Uh, whereas we know that for some of these machine learning methods, um, they can utilize um, some of their power to automatically detect some of these non-linearity non and non-additivities. Uh, so for example, some of the tree-based methods have this um, additional uh, advantage. Uh, but one of the problem with machine learning methods is that due to um, the slow convergence of those methods and the non parametric nature of those methods, uh, the coverage probabilities are often very poor. And that's why the standard error that you get out of those methods, even if you do bootstrap, are not really uh, that much reliable. So, in this particular chapter, we are just going to focus on estimating the treatment effect, and we do not care too much about the confidence interval, because uh, you will see later in the TMLE, there is a different procedure for finding the confidence interval. So in this particular chapter, we are just going to focus on treatment effect estimate. Before I move on, I just want a confirmation from my audience, whether you can still see the chapter three in the screen or uh, the sharing is not working. Okay, all right. So. Now that we kind of know the G competition, remember there were four steps in the G competition. First step was uh, getting the regression uh, and then getting the predictions for the exposed and unexposed and then get the treatment effect. So in the first step, we are talking about the getting the um, model um, and how can we get the model better? So as I have just explained that I can try to replace the um, linear regression with a machine learning method with the hope that the model specification would be automatically detected. One of the very popular machine learning algorithm is known as the XGBoost method, which is basically essentially a gradient boosting algorithm. And this is a very specific algorithm. Uh, and this is a winner algorithm in many of the Kaggle uh, competitions, right? So this must be good uh, in terms of an algorithm. So we have decided to use this algorithm. And one of the advantages of this algorithm is that this is a tree-based method and this gradient boosting. So it is uh, certainly possible for this type of algorithm to uh, automatically detect what type of interaction, what kind of transformation, what kind of uh, polynomials are helpful in identifying the correct specification of the model. So that's what we are going to do. In this XGBoost package, they basically require you to convert the data set into a matrix format. So we are extracting the model matrix and we are setting some particular values of the tuning parameters that they expect. Say, so for example, one of the parameter is max depth, which means the interaction depth. 
what kind of interaction depths you want. And here I'm kind of saying that I, I want up to 10 degree interaction or 10 degree polynomial or something like that. So, so that uh, it can have a lot of power in trying to identify the patterns in the data set. Uh, other parameters, I'm not going to talk too much in this particular workshop. Um, so what I basically have done, I have used the XGBoost package and the XGBoost function to get the fit. And from that fit, I basically get the uh, predicted values. And I can try to predict the values and get the density plots. And you can see the algorithm is so good that there is almost no distinction between the observed values and the predicted values. Um, but one of the reason for this is also uh, that we are using the same data for the model building and also for the um, prediction uh, error estimation. So for example, when we are using the root mean squared error, we are getting a very low root mean squared error. So obviously when we are using uh, the same data to build the model as well as to uh, get the predictions, this is sometime known as overfitting problem where the results are too optimistic. So the pred predictions are too optimistic and often unrealistic. Uh, one of the known methods to deal with or combat with these uh, too optimistic results is known as the cross validation. I hope that you kind of have a sense of what cross validation is. If not, let me give you a very brief understanding of what cross validation does. So in a cross validated data, what it does uh, is that it splits the data into a training part of the data and a test part of the data. So in terms of model building, what it does is at first in the training data, it tries to feed the model. So for example, the XGBoost model would be fitted in this training part of the data, right? Only this part. And then in the test data, we will assess the uh, loss function. So for example, RMSC or something like that in the test data to find a non-optimistic version of the um, error estimate. And then in the, I, I again shuffle the data in a way that is, is different part of the data is now the test data and um, the remaining part of the data is the training data. And I again build the model using the training data. I try to get the root mean square error estimates using uh, the test data using the model that I just built using the training data. And so then I get a new root mean squared error estimate uh, from the part of the data where the model was not built, all right? So in similar way, say for example, if you have three fold cross validation, then you will have three different type of patterns of the data for the testing and training, and you will get three different root mean squared error. And we can simply average out these three root mean squared error to get the estimate of the average RMSC. Um, and that will be a much better version of the uh, model uh, to get the um, predictions in future data or, or the data that uh, the model has not seen. So if you want to use this cross validation in R, uh, there are many ways to do this, uh, but I'm simply using the caret formulation or caret package to do this cross validation where I basically specify how many cross validation I want. So for example, in this, um, in, in here, what I'm basically doing, I'm just uh, specifying how many cross validation I want. Uh, so for the purposes of illustration, I'm just going to use a threefold cross validation. And I also specify um, what are the parameters that I want in the XGBoost algorithm. One of the nice features of this caret package is that it helps to fine tune some of the parameters that you are not sure about. So for example, remember previously we were talking about the max, max interaction depth. Um, and we, we previously set the max, max interaction depth to 10, which, is, uh, which was overfitting our data, right? So I just wanted to see 
uh, what other parameter values I can use that would not overfit my data as much. So I, I just use some of the values from two to 10 with two intervals. And I just want to see uh, which gives me better root mean squared error. So in the caret package, I simply use the train function to run my XGBoost uh, method or the XG, uh, XGB tree that is mentioned in this caret package. And I fine tune the um, parameter grid that I have just specified what type of parameters I want to use in the caret. And I also specify what type of cross validation I want uh, in the XGB TR control. So I specify all of these in the train function. So in the train function, I specify all of this cross validation and the fine tuning parameters. And it gives me the fit where it shows me what are the root mean square error associated with each of these max depth parameters that I have set. Uh, so in terms of root mean square, square, the smaller, the better, right? So when we were using 10 max depth, it was giving me a higher root mean squared error. But when we use a root mean, uh, a max depth of two, that means only two interaction, uh, then the root mean square is the minimal. So what this uh, caret package does, it, it automatically selects the final values used for these models are so it automatically selects all of these parameters. See the max depth is selected as two because that was giving the best root mean squared error out of all of the other parameters that we have set. So basically what I'm saying is this, this caret package is a nice way to uh, use this cross validation as well as doing all of this fine tuning that you want to do in your model to obtain the best tuning for your model. So even if, uh, the XGBoost is a very complicated model, uh, but caret package can accommodate all of these uh, new uh, models into its framework and can give you the uh, best estimate of the tuning. So once you use the caret package and know the best tuning, you can simply get a prediction out of that um, caret package estimate uh, from the XGBoost. And you, when, when you plot it, you can see now there are some deviations from what the original Y was and what the predicted Y was. But then again, uh, when you estimate the root mean squared error, it is not as small as we have seen before. Previously, it was uh, below one, which was not very much realistic. But now that I have built my model using cross validation where model was built using some data and uh, uh, performance measures were uh, measured in some other part of the data, I get a more, more honest version of the model and the honest version of the performance measures. All right. So that was my step one for the G competition, building the model, right? What I have done is I have just replaced the uh, logistic regression, sorry, the linear regression model with the XGBoost model, which is a more flexible non-parametric method uh, for getting the uh, predictions. And once I get the model, I basically do go to the second step of the G competition, which is basically replace all of the observed A values to A and get the prediction. And also I go to the third step of the G competition, replace all of the A values to zero, and I obtain the prediction. And the last step is basically getting the uh, difference between these two and getting the mean of that. And when we do that, we can see that the mean estimate is slightly high. So the treatment effect estimate now, when we use the XGBoost method is four, right? So that was one method that we have used to estimate the G competition using machine learning. But machine learning method have, or machine learning has many different methods, right? XGBoost is not the only method. There are other popular methods such as regularized models or lasso models, which are also very popular in dealing with multicollinearity and variable selection and all that. So this is something we also wanted to test. And fortunately for the GLMnet or the package that fits the lasso method, it has a cv.glm that automatically does the cross validation for us. And once we do the 
model fitting using the cross validation uh, with uh, three cross validations or threefold cross validation. Then we can get some estimate of the first step of the G competition, right? So instead of XG boost, we can simply use a lasso method to get our new model. And once we have our new model using the lasso method, we can simply replace the A values to one to get the second step uh, G competition predictions. And we can also replace the A values to zero to get our third step G competition to get the predictions. And once we get the predictions, we can easily estimate the treatment effect estimate in the, sorry, it would be step four uh, in the G competition method. But now you see the treatment effect estimate is 2.7. Remember what was the treatment effect estimate when we were fitting the XG boost? It was four and now it is 2.7. That means when you are changing your machine learning method, it is trying to explore different patterns of the data and the average treatment effect that you will get out of that particular machine learning method can be slightly different. So which result should we now believe? Four or 2.7, right? So, and this is the same problem for any other machine learning method. So if you are trying to use a bagging method, if you are trying to use a random forest method, or if you are trying to use any other cart method or any other method, it might give you slightly different estimates of the treatment effect estimate. But this is the only thing that we are trying to get, getting the treatment effect estimate using this decompetition method, right? So how can we do better than just choosing a random method uh, from our machine learning toolbox? So one of the technique that we can use is that instead of using only one machine learning method, we can try to get an ensembled version of machine learning predictions. What that means is that instead of relying on only one machine learning method, I will probably re rely on multiple machine learning methods that I feel are suitable for modeling my data. And then I will try to somehow combine all of these predictions into one prediction so that I can get a better prediction for my G competition treatment effect estimate. All right, uh, before I move on to the next part, I just wanted to take a pause and take any question um, from the audience. Is there any, any question from what I have already covered in this chapter three? You can type it in the chat box. There is one question in the chat about cross-validation. Okay. Um, so despite using CV, are we still predicting on the same data uh, used to build the model, right? Yes, <laughs> that, that is exactly right. So there are other versions of the um, cross validation such as cross fitting that does a outer um, version of a fold where it makes the predictions and stuff like that. Using that, uh, we can certainly extend this to a newer part of the data. Um, and that that would be then a more honest version of cross validation. Um, but I will talk about that at the very last part of this uh, particular chapter. Uh, but thank you for the question. It is true that even though we are doing cross validation, eventually we are using the same data to build the model uh, overall, generally speaking, and using the same data to get the prediction. But that's still better than using just the one data set uh, without cross validation, right? Yes, uh, you are right that we are predicting counterfactual exposure um, so outcomes for each of the exposures for each part participants. That is also correct. So that is one of the reasons why we need to use the whole data inside the cross validation in this particular example. Any other questions? Okay, if not, let me move on to the ensembled version of the machine learning methods or which is known as the super learner method uh, in, in the causal inference literature. So in this particular um, 
section, what I'm going to cover is super learner, which uses cross validation to find the weighted combination of the estimate uh, from the different candidate learners to get a better prediction uh, than any single particular predict, uh, prediction or any part in any single learner. Say for example, if you have just XGBoost, you have one particular column. If you just use the GLM, you have another particular column. And if you have um, a lasso method, that, then you also have another particular column for the predictions from all of these uh, uh, outcomes. Uh, but what this super learner is going to do is it will try to get some sort of weighted average um, to get a new column for prediction, uh, which will take the best part of all of these uh, predictions that we have so far. So let me explain that in a step-by-step -step fashion. Uh, so for running a super learner, what we do is we simply follow these four steps. First, we try to identify the candidate learners. Which of the candidate learners you think are most suitable in finding the relationship in your data set? And you pick all of those methods. Obviously, the more methods you have, the more computing time you will need. So you have to be a bit judicious about selecting which method is probably going to work better for you. In the second step, you have to choose the cross validation or K uh, for uh, the getting the cross validated uh, loss function. Uh, so in here, you can choose K based on the amount of data you have. The general rule is if you have a large amount of data, then you need less number of K. Um, but if you have a smaller uh, data, then you need a large number of K uh, to build this uh, cross validation and get honest prediction from, from it. Um, the third step is selecting a loss function for the meta learner. Meta learner is something that I'm going to explain a bit later. And then the, in the fourth step, we will find the super learner prediction that is just going to be that one column that will combine the impact of all of these other uh, candidate learners prediction. Uh, and there are two versions of the super learner prediction that I will also go into more detail a bit later. So in, in terms of identifying candidate learner, one of the uh, aspect of super learner that is very important is that you do not rely on just one type of method. So just do not pick all of the methods that are tree-based, say for example. If you pick all of the methods that are tree-based, there are other type of methods that could bring in other strengths. Say for example, these parametric models could bring you some efficiency, whereas these tree-based methods can bring you the uh, impact of what would happen with different uh, uh, interaction depths uh, for the SVM method, it could give you some of the ideas of what additional type of transformation you could do and stuff like that. So generally speaking, as long as, you, as your computing time is allowed or computing research is available, try to choose a variety of candidate learners. Do not just stick to just parametric or non-parametric or uh, something like that. And also just choosing a parameter, uh, a model is not enough you should also do fine tuning to find out the best uh, tuning parameters for that model. So as you can see, this is not just a matter of just choosing a model, a bunch of models. It's also a matter of fine tuning and finding out the best combination or the parameter grid for that model. So for just for demonstration purpose, in our example, I'm just going to use the linear model as well as the lasso model uh, using the GLMnet and the XGBoost. Uh, for our particular example. In terms of in the second step, choosing the cross validation K, uh, just for reducing the computing time, I'm using K equal, K equal to three, or they call it B uh, equal to three uh, cross validation. And then I try to select a loss function for the meta learner, which I'm going to talk about a bit later. So for that uh, meta learner, I'm just going to use a loss function such as uh, method dot, uh, nonlinear list square. Um, and then what I do is I fit the super learn, learning package where I specify the uh, number of folds for the cross validation. I also specify the super learning library. So the three candidate learners that I have, I specify them. And I also specify the loss function uh, that I choose. 
And once I specify all of this method, super learning method uh, does the cross validation to find out the uh, estimates from the meta learner. For, but before that, it also reports all of the predictions from each of these candidate learners that you have chosen. Say for example, in our candidate learner list, we only had three methods, right? GLM, GLMnet and XGBoost. And cross after cross validation and after running the super learning, it will give you the predictions from all of these three different learners. So you could run them separately on your own, but uh, super learning, uh, learner will automatically give you these uh, prediction models. And super learner will also give you the cross validated um, risk estimate based on which you can kind of get a sense of which uh, model is performing better, right? Say for example, the lower is better. That means this GLM net is performing better than any of the other methods that are um, used in this particular super learner. So once we have the predictions and once we have the cross validated risk, uh, then we have two choices. The first choice is to get the super learning prediction from discrete super learner. What this discrete super learner means is that forget about the other methods that are not performing well in, in terms of the cross validated risk. Just pick the method that is doing better in terms of the cross validated risk or the minimum value that you have in terms of the cross validated risk and just choose that column as your super discrete super learning uh, prediction. So that is how this is working uh, that you are just choosing the least cross validated error and then you are trying to get the uh, best estimate uh, from the prediction. The other method is known as the ensemble super learner. What it does is it has all of these predictions. So these, this is y hat one, this is y hat two, and this is y hat three, say for example. It tries to build a regression where original y or the observed y is the outcome. And these three columns are the input columns, right? And then you can feed a nonlinear least square to get the coefficients and obviously you, you can scale the coefficients so that the sum of the coefficients is equal to one um, and you can get the coefficients for all of that uh, three different uh, uh, y hat and you can see when you scale it it says that 93 percent of the um, the contribution for building that regression is coming from glm net uh, only six percent is coming from the xgboost and GLM is actually not contributing anything. Uh, so that means that what you will do is you will just multiply these coefficients with your predicted values to get a new column. So after multiplying, you get this uh, new column. And once you get a row sum, you get a um, optimum combination. So, or the weighted average of or weighted sum of all of these different predictions uh, that you have got. Um, and, and if you also obtain the uh, dollar trade from the uh, output of the super learner, you will also get the exactly same estimates that you have obtained just by doing the hand calculations. So basically there are two steps for the, or the two ways for the super learner. One is you choose the best cross related risk and get the prediction from only that method. So for example, in our previous example, what we had is we had this uh, GLM net methods cross related risk was the lowest. So in the discrete super learning, we would only choose this column. Alternatively, you can do a uh, ensemble super learner where you take a a uh, weighted combination of all of these predictions to get one column of prediction. And that is called ensemble super learner. So anyway, so in super learner, there are these two ways, but we are just going to focus on this ensemble super learner where we are taking this weighted average for all of these predictions that we have out of all of the candidate learners. Once we have this prediction column, then it is very easy. We just go to the step two of the G competition to get the prediction where our A was one. And we go to the third step of the G competition where our A was zero. I still get the prediction. 
And in the step four, sorry, it should be step four. In the step four, I, I simply get a mean of this treatment effect estimate uh, which is basically the difference between the two predictions that I got in the step two and three. Um, and then I get a treatment effect estimate of 1.91, which is very different from what we got for XG boost. Remember for the XG boost, the treatment effect estimate was four for the um, GLM net, the XG boost, the uh, treatment effect estimate was uh, something like, uh, uh, two point something, I guess. Uh, but for the um, super learning, when we use the ensemble method, we get a treatment effect estimate of 1.9. And there are some other details of how to choose K and what type of cross validation you have to choose and uh, what do you do in the dependent samples that I have listed in this particular uh, page. But generally speaking, uh, you, you can see the general pattern here we first try to identify a model that is working better for us. In this particular case, we have chosen to use a super learner that will combine the predictions from many other candidate learners that we uh, think are useful in modeling our data. Once we get the model, we simply get the prediction where all exposure was one, and then we get the prediction when all exposure was zero, then we, we take subtraction of these two type of predictions that we get from these two different conditions. And then we take the mean to get the treatment effect estimate. So that brings me to the end of this uh, G-competition using ML. Before moving on to the next chapter, IPTW, is there any particular question about this chapter? You can type it in the chat box. All right, so obviously you can see when you are using the uh, uh, super learner that is using different uh, type of uh, predictions from different learners, uh, the treatment effect estimate that we got from the XG boost or the treatment effect estimate that we got from the GLM net uh, is slightly different than the treatment effect estimate that we got from the super learner. So the question is, is there an intuition behind what is happening or why we are getting, uh, why, why we are not really getting something in between, right? Um, and that kind of depends on, uh, because this is, this is really a, a multi-step process. So in one step, if we are just talking about uh, super learning predictions. Uh, if you talk about the super learning predictions and we get the ensemble learner, say for example, you, you are getting 14.5 for the first patient uh, when we feed the super learning model, right? But when, when we had all of this, uh, we, we essentially had something very similar, right? Uh, 14. Point what is it, 14.5359 uh, uh, and 14.59. So that means that when we are talking about the predictions our from the super learner, our prediction was actually somewhere in, the, in between, right? Because it is taking some sort of weighted average. But then what it, when it is converting to the next step of trying to estimate the treatment effect estimate, then the relationship is not that linear anymore. Okay, so the next question is, could you please compare and contrast treatment effect obtained from G competition versus the propensity score matching? All right, so in the G competition, what, what is happening is that we are relying on the outcome model. And in that outcome model, we are trying to build our outcome model to the best of our ability. But in the propensity score matching, what is happening is that we are relying on the modeling in the exposure state, right? Uh, and this question is actually very relevant for the next chapter that I'm going to cover. So let me dive into the next chapter of IPTW, and then I can try to explain this um, answer a bit more detail. Any other question uh, from this particular chapter? 
Okay. If not, then let me move on to the IPTW chapter, which is very similar to the propensity. Uh, so it is also using the propensity score uh, to get the IPTW. So there is some similarity between the IPTW as well as the uh, propensity score matching because we are first building the propensity score model and then we're uh, dealing with the treatment effect estimate in different ways. Propensity score matching is one way, IPTW is another way. All right, so in this propensity score world, what we are basically doing is that instead of focusing on how to make our outcome model better, we focus on how to make our exposure model better. So the focus is slightly different here. So instead of just focusing on how, how to best model our outcome, we here first focus on how to best focus, uh, how to best model our exposure model. And this exposure model is the propensity score model that we will see now. So once we have that uh, exposure model, then we try to focus on uh, balance and then we, we think about outcome modeling, but the focus is on exposure modeling. So if we try to do the inverse probability of treatment weighting, there are four steps that we need to follow. And in this uh, IPTW, the first step is obvious to, to feed a propensity score model or the exposure model where we are modeling A, not Y, right? So we are modeling uh, the probability of getting the RHC instead of the uh, Y or the length of stay. Once we get the pro propensity scores, um, from this particular model, we then use a particular formula to convert the propensity scores to IPW or IPTW. I'm just going to use the IPTW and IPW as uh, synonymously in this particular example. Uh, and once we have that, uh, then we try to use this IPW as a weight in the sample. And then in the sample, we try to see the balance. And once we are happy with the balance, then we do the outcome modeling. I will also show later what will happen if there is, uh, we are not satisfied with balance. That, that is something I will show later, but let us just go through what I do in the first four steps. In the first step, I try to build the exposure model. See, the outcome is A here. And I'm still using the same confounders or the covariance that I have in the data set. So this is the propensity score formula that I'm going to use. A is the outcome here. And in this propensity score model, obviously we can try to make the propensity score model better by adding interaction polynomial and stuff like that, or some kind of transformation if that is helpful. Once we have that, we try to run a logistic regression model because we are dealing with a binary outcome here. Our treatment is binary, right? RHC versus not RHC. Then we can see the propensity score model. But interestingly, I do not necessarily care about any of this odds ratio or the coefficients. So for propensity score model, these odds ratios or the coefficients are not important. What is important is the prediction that I'm getting and uh, also checking the balance. So this uh, coefficients are not that interesting. The only thing that may be interesting is sometimes you can see the confidence intervals are very wide and then your propensity score estimate can get uh, very unstable. So that is probably one thing for which you should check the propensity score model fit. Otherwise it's not, uh, the coefficients are not really that interesting. And generally speaking, you will see later as well, we generally denote these propensity scores as G. Previously, remember when we were dealing with the G competition, we were saying that we denote the G competition predictions as Q, but for the propensity scores, uh, it is known as G. Can you excuse me for one minute? I just need to drink a, uh, a bit water.
All right, so I'm I'm back with my water glass. All right, so previously when we were talking about G competition and the predictions from G competition, we we named it Q. But now that we are talking about propensity score, the predictions are usually known as G. G, G here, and in when we get the propensity score model fitted, we simply can get the prediction out of the propensity score model. And we can try to see whether they belong uh, between and bounded between zero to one, because this, these are probabilities, right? Probability of getting the RHC treatment given the covariates. We can also try to cross classify the propensity scores in terms of the uh, treatment values. Like for not, no RHC, I get uh, from zero to uh, 0.95, for RHC, I get uh, approximately near zero to 0.96. But a better uh, procedure would be to check the density plots, whether they are overlapping or not. That is something that is very important in terms of any propensity score method. And then once we have the propensity score, we can simply use them to calculate the inverse probability weights using this uh, simple formula. And once we convert the inverse probability weight, we can check the balance. So there are a couple of ways to check the balance, but the most popular one is to check the SMD or the standardized mean difference. And we try to see whether the standardized mean differences are less than or equal to uh, 0.1 or not. So if the standardized mean difference is uh, greater than 0.1, we generally say that we do not have a balance. So we can check the standardized mean difference or balance using the COBOL package. And you can see uh, there is a big table listed balance, not balance and stuff like that. But what is important is at the end of this table, it says that there was no covariate or covariate category that was imbalanced. So we are kind of happy with our analysis. You can also see the same using a plot, which is known as the LAV plot. And in this LAV plot, you can see, uh, so these green, sorry, the blue ones are the adjusted or the weighted estimates from the SMD. And these red ones are unadjusted when you did not weight. And you can see the red ones were going beyond 0.1 SMD, but the blue ones are remaining within the 0.1. So we are happy with the weighting. Once we have done the weighting, that means that all of the covariates are balanced. This is kind of like a similar scenario what happens in the uh, randomized clinical trial. And since we are happy with the covariate balance in the weighted data, what we can do is the weighted data, we can simply run a crude model. We do not care about adjustment anymore because we are happy with the balance and we can see the treatment effect estimate that we are getting is three point something in our data set. Right, so that is basically a quick rundown of uh, how we would run a uh, inverse probability weighted analysis to get the treatment effect estimate. So similar to G competition, you can also imagine that when we are building this propensity score model, here we are basically using a logistic regression uh, when we have 49 covariates, right? But instead of using logistic regression, it is certainly possible to use a machine learning method or better yet, a super learning method to get the estimates, treatment effect estimates. So that is the uh, main theme of the next chapter. But before I go to the next chapter, is there any question that I can answer in between? You can type it in the chat. Okay, so if you look at the density plot, um, you kind of have a, try to get a sense of whether they are overlapping or not, because numerically it is not very easy to uh, check. In this density plot, obviously, as you can see, there is good overlap here. So there is density is here and here, but at the very end, there might not be uh, that good overlap, right? But then again, generally speaking, uh, if the numbers are not very close to zero or very close to one, 
we are not generally too, uh, there is, it's not really a big problem. The one thing that you obviously should take a look is the summary of the inverse probability weighting. See, for example, uh, the max summary is 6.3. That means there was one person who was given weight of 63 persons in that same data set, right? So, but 63 in terms of inverse probability weight, given that we have a data set of more uh, approximately close to 6,000 uh, patient in the data set, it's probably not that problematic. So if our data set is 5,000, say for example, and the maximum weight is 5,000, that means what? One person is given the weight of the entire other uh, population that you have in the data set. So that would not be good. But in here, we, we kind of have a like a 11 or 12 percent um, of the weight, uh, and that's probably not, not or, or even less, like uh, uh, one person, I guess, one person or two percent. So that's not really a big weight that I would worry about too much. All right, so the second question was, should we always use uh, stabilized weights? Uh, generally speaking, in terms of the theory, if you are using stabilized weights, one of the advantage of using stabilized weights is that you are getting a uh, more efficient version of the standard error and consequently the confidence interval will be more reasonable. Uh, but if you are using unstabilized weights, it is certainly possible that you can run into a problem of uh, very large weight, uh, and that will also impact your uh, estimate, uh, treatment effect estimate, and the confidence interval estimate. Right. So yes, the if you poss if possible, use the stabilized weights. Uh, all right. So let me move on to the last chapter that I'm going to cover after me. I will take a break and then Hannah will cover the chapter six and uh, seven, uh, the TMLE and the software part. So let me just give a quick rundown of uh, what is the IPW using ML. So what basically we are doing, what's the difference between this chapter four and chapter five is basically we are replacing this step uh, from logistic regression to a machine learning method. It could be XGBoost, it could be a lasso method, but we are just going to stick with the um, super learning algorithm that is just going to take the weighted average of all of the candidate learners, right? So just the one thing that we are going to change in the IPTW modeling is that we are basically going to use the same data uh, but we are just going to, instead of just relying on the logistic regression, we are just going to work with the GLM net as well as the XGBoost and get the super learner. And using that super learner, we'll get the prediction, which are going to be the propensity scores, and then we will get the treatment effect estimates, right? So let me run down the process one more time. So the step one is basically exposure modeling. Step two is conversion to IPTW. Step three is balance and step four is the outcome modeling. So in the first step, instead of logistic regression model, we are basically using a super learner. In the second step, we are basically converting to the propensity scores uh, that we got from super learner to IPTW. And in the third step, what we are going to do is we are just going to check the balance. Interestingly, if you are using a a number of very powerful machine learning methods, sometimes what happens is that getting this balance can be very hard. Um, and you can go to the output from the Cobalt package and you can see, um, so these are not covariates, right? These are the categories of the covariates. So uh, 59 of the categories of the covariates were balanced, but there were at least nine categories of the covariates that were not balanced. Right, and that, that you can see from the plot as well. See this dotted line is basically our SMD of uh, point 0.1 and you can see there were nine points that are uh, blue that are outside of that bound. So there were some residual confounding you may say uh, in this, uh, in this uh, version of the weighted um, analysis. So there are, couple of steps that you can take. Say, for example, if you are not happy with the inverse probability weighted uh, estimates balance, then you can go back to the propensity score modeling step and you can try to include more interaction um, and change the modeling formula and stuff like that. Um, 
they but if since you are using the super learning it is already using xg boost and all of these different combinations so that's probably not something that is going to be helpful um, the alternative that you can use is that when you are doing the outcome modeling you instead of doing the crude modeling you can do the adjusted modeling when you are adjusting for the baseline confounders again in the outcome modeling even though you are using the uh, weighted version of that data so when you do that you get a point estimate of 2.9 and you can do it by hand or you can use the package like there is a package called weighted package and you can get the same estimate from the weighted package uh, which is going to be 2.9 so i see there is a uh, clarification from Hannah um, that you can see in the chat. Is there any particular question about this um, IPTW? Yes, that is exactly correct. That when you are using the IPTW, uh, you can basically think of creating pseudo population similar to our counterfactual idea uh, that in the pseudo population, there is no confounding anymore. So because if there was no confounding anymore, then we could use the crude estimate in the outcome model. But since in our last example, when we did the balance checking and we saw that there was some SMDs that were higher than uh, 0.1, there are a couple of things we could do. We could have adjusted for everything, uh, such as this one, we, we have adjusted for all of the baseline confounders or we could adjust for only those nine covariates that were imbalanced. Um, and that is supported by this particular uh, citation and you can check and uh, that would also adjust for uh, or address some of this residual confounding concern that you may have out of this analysis. All right, so that's the end of the chapter five. Is there Okay, is there a question? Does this methodology also apply to other matching techniques like coarsening, exact matching? Um, I, I think that in the exact matching, in the coarsening sense, that is a slightly different method that I, I do not necessarily want to cover in this uh, particular workshop. Uh, but I think uh, it's kind of like a, uh, different type of matching and algorithm. There are, there are many different type of matching algorithm and you should read the theory a bit closely to have a general understanding of what is possible in that type of matching algorithm. So unfortunately, I'm not going to cover this in this workshop. So <laughs> um, uh, I'm not going to uh, address this question. Any other question about this chapter? If not, let's take a 10 minute break. We'll just come back at, or nine minute break. <laughs> we'll just come back uh, in nine minutes and then Hannah will uh, start her discussion about Timely in, in the chapter six. So see you in nine minutes.
Okay, can you confirm that you can see my screen, please? I can, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, now that we've covered our outcome models, like those that we used in G computation and our exposure based models, like the propensity score methods that we talked about, um, we're going to talk about something called doubly robust estimators. So, doubly robust estimators, uh, they use information from both the exposure and the outcome models. Um, and this allows them to provide us with a consistent estimator. Um, if either the exposure or the outcome model is correctly specified. Um, and consistent estimator here means like as the sample size increases, the distribution of the estimates gets concentrated near the true value of the parameter that we're estimating. Um, and these doubly robust methods can also provide an efficient estimator if both the exposure and the outcome model are correctly specified. Um, so efficient estimator here means that our estimate actually approximates uh, the true value of the parameter we're interested in, in terms of the loss function that we've chosen. Um, so essentially the point is with these doubly robust estimators that uh, we have two chances to get our model specification correctly. Uh, so in the, in the methods that we discussed previously, we always only had one chance to specify our model correctly. But here we kind of have a backup system where if either of our uh, models that we've specified is correct, then we still get a consistent estimator. So TMLE, targeted maximum likelihood estimation, is one of these doubly robust methods. Um, and essentially it uses the propensity score or exposure model to improve on an initial estimate from uh, that we got from our outcome model or essentially our G computation step. So why do we use TMLE? Um, not only is it doubly robust, but it also allows for the use of data adaptive algorithms like machine learning without sacrificing interpretability. So what I mean by that is that machine learning is only used in the intermediary steps to develop our estimator rather than uh, perform performing the estimation directly with machine learning. And that means that we can create 95% uh, confidence intervals and such that are valid for statistical interpretation. Um, and as we covered before, the use of machine learning can help us mitigate this model misspecification. Um, and then also TMLE has been shown to outperform uh, some of these other methods that we've talked about before, uh, particularly in, in sparse data settings. So Luke Fernandez and his colleagues, uh, they made a really nice tutorial for TMLE and the steps of TMLE in R. Um, but they did it for a binary outcome. So we have a continuous outcome in our with our RHC data set. Uh, so there's a couple of steps we need to add at the beginning and at the end um, to make sure that our method can handle our data. So the first step for us is the transformation of our continuous outcome variable. So this is the step that you can skip if you have a binary outcome. Um, step two will be uh, making our predictions from our initial outcome modeling, so essentially G computation. Step three is then making predictions from our propensity score model to get our propensity scores. Step four um, is estimating something called a clever covariate H. Um, and step five is estimating a fluctuation parameter epsilon. And these steps four and five, I'll go more into uh, what these mean uh, in, in a bit. Um, and then step six will be uh, actually updating our initial outcome model prediction based on uh, our targeting using this clever covariate and the fluctuation parameter. Step seven then, once we have our updated uh, predictions, we can find our final treatment effect estimate. And then step eight is transforming back to our original outcome scale um, 
which again can be skipped if we have a binary outcome. And then step nine is just your usual confidence interval estimation, which we'll go into how, uh, how that works in a bit too. So we're gonna go through all of these steps one by one using the RHC data set that we've presented in the previous chapters. Um, but just as a reminder, the exposure that we're considering is RHC, right hard catheterization. And the outcome of interest is length of stay in the hospital. So step one, the transformation of our outcome Y. So in our example, the outcome is continuous. Um, and TMLE, it's in, T in TMLE, it's recommended that we uh, rescale our outcome so that it lies within the range of zero to one. And the reason behind this is that we're gonna make predictions um, for each of our observations based on the covariates. And um, we want these predictions to lie within the range uh, of our um, sample data. So we don't want to make predictions that fall outside of that range because we want this to stay something called a substitution estimator. So we have want to keep everything within that range. And to do that, we can use a logistic loss function uh, when we're doing our uh, estimations. And this logistic loss function essentially makes sure that we uh, make predictions that are within the range of zero to one. But for that to be possible, the data we pass in also has to be within this range of zero to one. Um, so that's the reasoning behind that. And um, so as you can see, our untransformed data, the Y values lie between two and 394, um, but most of our values fall within the range of zero to 50. So to transform this data, um, you do your standard scaling procedure. So for each observation, we subtract the minimum of our sample uh, range and divide by the whole range. And then if we check our range, we're between zero and one. So step two then is our initial G computation estimate. So to do this, we first have to construct our outcome model uh, and make our initial predictions. And to construct our outcome model, we're gonna use SuperLearner, um, which we went over a, a couple chapters ago. So we use SuperLearner again, because it requires us not to make any assumptions before um, about the structure of our outcome model or the structure of our data um, and helps us kind of avoid this model misspecification. So to fit our super learner, uh, we pass in our transform data for our Y value. Um, all the rest is uh, within our X and um, we define our super learner library. Um, here we've used uh, the same library as we've done in previous chapters. And then the important argument here is this method argument. And here we specify that we want to use a logistic loss function to stay within the zero to one range. So once we have our super learner, we can make our predictions. And here's a summary of our predictions that we get initially, but keep in mind, this is on the transform scale. So this is not in, uh, in our original scale of days. Um, and then a note again, I think we went over this before, but this Q not AL is often what's used to represent these predictions, um, where A is your exposure and L is your covariates. So now comes the part that's kind of similar to G computation. We need to get predictions for all our observations uh, under uh, untreated and treated. So first we set all of our exposures in our data set to be one, so treated, and then we make predictions on that. And then we do the same thing for untreated. So we set all of our exposures to be zero and make predictions on that data set. And then we can already get an initial treatment effect estimate just by taking the difference between these predictions for our exposed and unexposed individuals. So our mean here is around 0 
But again, keep in mind, this is still on the transformed scale. So step three then is our propensity score model. So at this point, we have our initial estimate already and we want to perform our targeting step. So for this, we need to calculate our propensity scores. Um, and to do that, we're again gonna use a super learner, uh, but this time we're passing in our exposure as the dependent variable uh, and all of the covariates as the uh, independent variables. Um, we're using the same super learner library. Um, and again, we keep this uh, logistic uh, loss function here as the method. Um, so then the predictions that we get from the super learner, those are our propensity scores. And again, these are represented as this G function, uh, G of AI equals one given LI. So the probability that uh, the exposure of the ith observation is one given the covariates that this observation has. And we can also estimate the probability of the exposure being zero, so being unexposed, given their covariates as just one minus this propensity score that we calculated. So here again, we look at the ranges of these propensity scores for the unexposed group and for the exposed group. And as you can see, they, they overlap almost entirely in their, uh, in their ranges, but um, here you get a better idea of how those who received RHC were actually more likely to receive RHC and those who are not, who did not receive RHC were likely to not receive RHC. Uh, but we do have a, a fairly good amount of overlap. So step four is then estimating this thing called a clever covariate. So the clever covariate, I'm not gonna go into too much detail uh, about the theory behind it, um, but essentially semi-parametric theory has shown that the use of this covariate in the next steps um, leads to convergence and leads us to be able to do this targeting step where we move from our initial estimate uh, closer to the actual true value of uh, the parameter that we're trying to estimate. So the clever covariate is defined using these propensity scores that we just calculated. Um, and essentially for exposed uh, individuals, you'll get one over the probability that they were exposed given their covariates. Um, and for unexposed individuals, you're gonna get negative one over the probability that they were unexposed given their covariates. And um, something to note here about these clever covariates, you can use them either in this form, this entire form that this formula gives. Um, so you have one clever covariate, um, or you can use it in the split up form where you use each part of this equation as a clever covariate. So you end up with a two component clever covariate, one component for exposed individuals and one for unexposed individuals. Um, and the two component version, that's recommended usually um, because it uh, allows for a bit more fine tuning. You're, you're targeting um, the exposed and unexposed individuals separately. Um, whereas the cumulative uh, covariate, that can be useful if you want to use this covariate as, um, as, a, as a weight rather than a covariate in the coming steps. We're only gonna show the covariate uh, version, but I'll, I'll mention it again in a bit. Um, yeah, so from now on, we're gonna show both of these uh, two component clever covariate and one component clever covariate versions for all the coming steps. So here is just a quick comparison of these versions. So up here, we see the cumulative uh, clever covariate, uh, which is split up for unexposed and exposed individuals. And down here, we have this uh, two component clever covariate with the unexposed um, component and the exposed component. So you can see that the ranges of these two vary a little bit. So 
So the next step is estimating epsilon. So epsilon is something that we call a fluctuation parameter. And this fluctuation parameter essentially represents how big of an adjustment we want to make uh, to the initial estimate. So depending on, um, depending on how, uh, how we've defined our clever covariate, so if we've used the one component or two component version, then we end up with a scalar or a vector with two components in this epsilon as well. Um, and epsilon is estimated through maximum likelihood estimation. Uh, using a model with an offset that's based on our initial estimate that we got from our G computation step um, and the clever covariates as uh, independent variables. Or as mentioned before, you could use them as weights in this uh, maximum likelihood estimation, but we're going to just show how to use them as covariates. So if we have the two component epsilon and clever covariate, then our uh, regression function to estimate epsilon looks like this. We have uh, the clever covariate for exposed individuals and for unexposed individuals in here. Um, and we're using a binomial, so a logistic regression. Um, and then the coefficients of these clever covariates, those will be our epsilons. So this would be the epsilon for exposed individuals, and down here would be the epsilon for unexposed individuals. For a one component epsilon, it's similar, but we only have this one clever covariate in our logistic regression function. So we don't have the two separate ones for exposed and unexposed individual, but we just use the same one. And then we also only end up with one coefficient, so one epsilon. And you can see that these are uh, pretty different, actually, these uh, clever covariates for the two component and the one component epsilon. But at the end, we'll see that in the grand scheme of things in the final estimate, it actually, in our data set at least, doesn't make that much of a difference. So now that we have these epsilons and our clever covariates, we can actually perform our, our, our actual update. Um, and the way we do that is for all of our observations, um, the initials predi initial predictions we made for the exposed individuals, we update those uh, in the two component epsilon version at least. We update those using the epsilon for exposed and the clever co covariate for the exposed in this function. Um, and then we do the same for the unexposed individuals but with the unexposed version for epsilon and the clever covariate. So essentially, it's our initial prediction plus the epsilon times the clever covariate. And that gives us our updated predictions. But again, we're on a transform scale here. So if we only have one epsilon, it's very similar. But all. Uh, all we do is essentially we use the same epsilon and the same clever covariate for both of these functions. So we update with the same epsilon and clever covariate in our, uh, in our exposed group and our unexposed group. So now that we have that, we can, uh, so we have all of our updated predictions from our outcome models. So now we can just calculate the, uh, average treatment effect in the same way that we've always done, taking the difference between the predictions made for our um, exposed group and our unexposed group. Um, and this is gonna be the same regardless of which format of epsilon we have. So for the two component epsilon, we get the estimate of around 0 0.007. Um, and for the one component epsilon, same formula, we get also around 0 0.007. So on the transform scale, you can see that it really doesn't make that much of a difference in our data set, which of these epsilon versions we're using. And then our last step is rescaling back to our original outcome scale. So this is again the same, uh, no matter which uh, epsilon format you have, um, you just multiply by the by our original sample range. Um, and we get around 2.73 for the two epsilon version and around 
2.8 for our single epsilon version. So this now is in, in, um, in units of days. So this is essentially the increase in days um, that is expected when a patient receives RHC versus when they don't. And then lastly, we can also do confidence interval estimation. Um, so again, since the machine learning algorithms were only used in the intermediary steps, rather than estimating our parameter of interest directly, these 95% confidence intervals can be calculated and um, give us some valid inference. So I'm not gonna go into this formula and the details of it, but essentially based on semi-parametric theory, this closed form variance formula has already been derived for this procedure. Um, and you don't need a time consuming bootstrap procedure or anything. So in your own time, you can go through this code and um, see exactly what that formula is. But I'll just show you the results. So for our two component epsilon version, um, this is the confidence interval here. Uh, and below for one epsilon. And they're fairly similar again for our data set. And that already wraps it up for TMLE. Um, so I'll, I guess I'll take any questions if, if there is anything in the chat. If there's nothing, I think I'll move on to the next chapter. Yeah, we can move on to the next chapter. Um, yeah, so this chapter, I just wanted to talk about some of the pre-packaged software options in R. So these are libraries that you can use. Um, to perform some of the things that we've talked about. Um, so the first package that I want to talk about is TMLE. Um, and this package handles both binary and uh, continuous outcomes. And it uses the super learner package to construct both of the models just like we did in the steps in the previous chapter. Um, the default super learner libraries for the outcome and the propensity scores uh, models are a little different, so I've just listed those here. Um, but of course, again, it's possible to uh, specify a different set of learners if there's something else that you want to use. Um, and these can be specified with the q.sl.library argument for the uh, outcome model and the g.sl.library argument for the propensity score model. Um, the one important thing to note about this package is that the outcome y is required to be within the range of zero to one for this method. So the data you pass in already has to be transformed. Um, and then afterwards, when you get the estimate from the function, you have to transform it back yourself to the original scale. So it does not do that for us. So I just have a demonstration of using this package. Um, so First step, just as before, transforming our outcome data to fall within the range of zero to one. Um, same thing as we did in the previous chapter. And then you specify your super learner library. So for sake of uh, comparison, I have specified the same library that we used in chapter six. Um, and then you call this TMLE function. Make sure to pass in your transform data. Um, and your uh, super learner libraries if you change something there. And then this fit looks a bit like this. Um, and if you take a summary of the fit, then you can see the um, coefficients of uh, all of these candidate algorithms that you have uh, specified when you called TMLE. So this one is for, for the estimation of our outcome model. These are the coefficients that it thought were best. Um, so that's the combination of these algorithms that it has chosen. 
And then for the treatment model, we can see the same thing. These coefficients um, are used in the treatment model. And we can also get our uh, ATE estimate directly from this, uh, from this fit. But uh, keep in mind that this is not, uh, this is on the transform scale still. So we have to perform our transformation back to our original outcome scale still. And we end up getting 2.87, which is pretty close to what we got in our step-by-step -step version in the last chapter as well. So another nice thing is that you can get the confidence interval directly from our fit. But again, note that you have to transform back to the original scale. Otherwise, your confidence interval isn't going to make much sense. So this is uh, our final estimate that we get from this package uh, with its confidence interval next to it. And then just a couple of notes about this package. Again, it doesn't scale the outcome for you. Um, but if you forget to scale your outcome um, and the, algor or the algorithm is trying to deal with uh, outcome types that it's not expecting or variable types it's not expecting, it does give really helpful error messages. Um, and yeah, basically all of these steps are nicely packed up into this one fact function and it's very easy to use. Um, but we wanted to go through all these steps because it's difficult to understand otherwise what's going on behind the scenes. Um, and I've also linked some of the resources that were helpful for this package. Um, another side note with TMLE, with this TMLE package, is that if you have previously calculated propensity scores um, for your data, you don't have to have uh, TMLE rebuild a whole uh, propensity score model using SuperLearner um, in, in this function. Um, you can actually pass in your propensity score predictions directly. So say if you wanted to use um, a propensity scores that were predicted in a different way uh, than, than SuperLearner, for example, here we're showing it with the, the propensity scores that we calculated using the weighted package. Um, you can just pass in those propensity scores with this argument G1W um, and the TMLE function will use that as its propensity scores. So if we use that and transform back to our uh, original scale, we end up with the result of 3.1. So obviously, um, a bit higher than what we've gotten with uh, the the other with the super learner for the propensity scores and such. But um, yeah, if you have other methods that you'd like to use for propensity scores, that is possible. And this also reduces computation time if you already have them from somewhere else. So the second package that I wanted to talk about is a super learner package. It's not a TMLE package, so it doesn't implement all the TMLE steps. It's just for uh, creating super learners. Um, and SL3 is a newer package, and it's uh, kind of designed to be more customizable than the super learner package that we've used in Chapter 6 and that TMLE uses. Um, and it implements discrete and ensemble super learning. So discrete was the one where uh, it just chooses the best prediction algorithm from our specified list. Um, and ensemble super learning was where it uh, returns a linear combination or some kind of combination of the algorithms that we've, we've specified. So with SL3, the, it's a little more complicated than using the super learner package. Um, there's a couple more steps that we need to do which is what makes it so customizable. Um, so the first thing that we have to do is make an SL3 task. Um, and this SL3 task, essentially it uh, keeps track of the roles of the variables in our problem. So you pass in the data, you pass in covariant names and the outcome. And um, yeah, pass that into this make SL3 task function and you end up with a task that looks like this. Um, 
you have your list of covariates and you have your outcome specified. And then the next step is to actually create our superlearner. So again, um, just as for the superlearner library, we have to specify a selection of these machine learning algorithms that we want to include as candidates. Um, but this time we also have to specify a meta learner, which is also a machine learning algorithm that super learner will use to combine or choose from the machine learning algorithms that we've provided as our candidate algorithms. Um, so SL3 has a really nice function where you can see all of the different um, machine learning algorithms that are available uh, just using this SL3 list learners function. And you can pass in um, either continuous or binary depending on your type of outcome. Um, and then you get this nice list of available algorithms for your specific outcome type. So whatever algorithms you choose, these then need to be initialized first using this make learner function. And then they need to be collected in something called a stack. Um, and the stack is made with, again, with this make learner function, but you pass in this stack argument up front. So then to actually make our super learner, um, we have to pass in our, our list of learners, which is our stack. And then we also have to pass in our meta learner which is initialized similarly to how our other algorithms were initialized. Um, and I've shown two different uh, options here. The first one is uh, the ensemble option, um, but there are different meta learners that you can use. Um, and then the second one is an example of a discrete uh, super learner. So we have the CV selector. So it just selects one, uh, the one that's the best. So now that we have our super learner initialized, we train it on our um, task, our SL3 task that we created in the very first step. Um, and then we can make our predictions um, for our outcomes. And just for sake of comparison again, we've shown um, the mean difference between these predictions for exposed and unexposed uh, to get our treatment effect estimate. And that is around 5.33 for this package. Um, it is a bit higher than what uh, we would expect based on what we've gotten from other um, algorithms and other packages, but we did have to tweak a few things in terms of um, in terms of parameters for our candidate algorithms and such to be able to run this within a reasonable time frame, um, since. Uh, these super learner things can be very uh, computationally in intensive. So that could be what is contributing to this being quite high. So a couple of notes about the SL3 package. It's pretty easy to implement uh, and understand the structure enough for at least a basic implementation. Um, and it has a very large selection of candidate algorithms provided and a really nice way of looking at all those uh, different candidate algorithms. Um, it's a very different structure from the super learner library. So it has a lot more steps, but it is very customizable. So I think it's uh, more likely that this is usable for a variety of different scenarios. So, and then, oh yeah, I've also listed a couple of the helpful resources for this package if you wanna look at that uh, in your spare time. So the next thing is that we have this table um, representing all of the different estimates that we've made uh, in, this, uh, in this workshop with all the different methods that we've looked at. So starting with uh, the adjusted regression, going through propensity score matching, G computation with and without uh, machine learning, um, IPW with and without machine learning, and um, TMLE and SL3 package. And then at the very bottom, we also have the comparison with this Keel and small paper. Um, so you'll notice that a lot of these point estimates are quite close. Um, a lot of them are around 2.9, 3 or so. 
um, and uh, especially these TMLE, um, TMLE point estimates are very close to our adjusted regression estimates. So probably could be that our adjusted regression actually gives it quite a good estimate. Um, but the thing to note is that uh, our TMLE um, confidence intervals are much narrower than that what we got for adjusted regression. So there is still that benefit to using TMLE. Um, another thing to note is that for these pure machine learning methods, um, these G computations with these machine learning methods and the SL3 package results, we don't have confidence intervals because there's no theoretical basis really for valid confidence intervals for these. Um, and so that's another huge benefit of this TMLE procedure uh, because we can get valid confidence intervals and use the machine learning. Um, and you'll probably also notice that this Keel and Small paper, their point estimate is quite a bit lower than most of what we've gotten from our methods. Um, but they also used an ensemble of different learners than we used in our methods um, in their TMLE. So that could definitely contribute to that difference. And then the last thing that I'll mention is some other packages that might be useful in your research. So um, LTMLE is a package that's uh, TMLE for longitudinal outcomes. So that could be useful if you deal with those uh, longitudinal scenarios. Uh, TMLE3, this one is still under development, but kind of goes hand in hand with the SL3 package uh, in that it's built to be more customizable and uses SL3 in its super learner uh, implementations. Um, and then AIPW, this is a package for uh, another doubly robust method, essentially a doubly robust version of inverse probability weighting. Um, so that could be useful as well. And then there's lots of other packages uh, that kind of relate to this topic as well. Um, so if you follow this link or if you look on CRAN or on GitHub, you can see lots of those as well. And that's it. So if there's any questions on this software chapter, I'll take those. Um, and I, I just wanted to have a general sense of when you use your, say for example, super learner package versus when you use the SL3, what is the main difference that jumps out for you? Uh, the main difference for me is that you have all these different steps of creating uh, the SL3 task and initializing these learners and uh, making the stack. And then also, I guess the meta learner is a big difference. Um, I don't think you have such a thing in the super learner package. Um, so the fact that you have a meta learner and can use different algorithms to um, optimize between the, um, the candidate algorithms that you've specified, that's a big difference. Um, yeah, I think those are the main differences, just the number of steps with uh, the task and initializing and such, and then also the, the meta learner. Right, so it, it's kind of more complicated, but at the expense of being more customizable. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. So if there is any question, please let us know in the chat box. Otherwise, I will probably move on to the last chapter of this tutorial. Can can anyone confirm that uh, you can see the chapter eight? We can see it. Okay. All right. So so far we have talked about uh, finding the best model to predict your outcome or predict your exposure. Um, and, and so for example, in TMLE, we try to 
mash up both of those um, ideas into one, one particular framework. Uh, but there is a difference between what we mean by um, model specification uh, versus unmeasured conformity. Say, for example, if you have uh, a number of covariates, it's just that you do not necessarily know what are the best uh, possible transformations or combinations of interaction terms or polynomial terms, then this type of tree-based methods or these machine learning methods are usually very helpful. But in general, if you have some unmeasured confounding that was not measured at the design stage, um, then no matter what type of machine learning method you are planning to use, that's not really going to um, help you a lot uh, in terms of that unmeasured confounding. Um, if you do not really adjust for that, you do not really have the way to um, reduce the bias due to that particular confounder. So in this particular plot, you can see there are many different ways a third variable could affect the relationship between the exposure and the outcome. Um, and in this particular uh, tutorial, we have just talked about confounders, but there could be the other roles of the covariates that we collect during the process of the uh, data collection. Say, for example, uh, so say this L is a confounder because it affects A as well as it affects Y, uh, but C is something that is impact of A and impact of Y, and certainly we do not want to adjust for something like C here. R is a variable that is a uh, risk factor for the outcome, and usually that does not impact too much on the uh, bias, but it reduces the uh, variability. So usually if you have a risk factor for the outcome, it is usually helpful to adjust in the model. If you have something like E, which is the effect of uh, outcome, you should not adjust for it. If you have a mediator variable that should not be treated as a confounder, the mediation analysis has a separate framework of its own. If you have a, say for example, instrumental variable that impacts uh, Y through your A, then this variable, if you adjust for it, that will amplify your bias. And other than that, if you have a noise variable that has neither, neither to, nothing to do with the A variable or the outcome variable, then um, this will only increase the variance if you are just adjusting for it. One other possibility is that you have an unmeasured confounding that you have not measured, but there is a proxy variable that you can find in your data set um, or link, to, link from another data set, um, then it is certainly possible to adjust for this P variable instead of this U variable, but obviously that will be still subject to some measurement error bias, right? So the main point that I want to convey is that so far we have just talked about this L variable here that we have adjusted and uh, tried to deal with in our various type of fancy analysis, but if you have other type of variables, as a uh, analyst, it, it is probably the best to talk with the subject area experts to determine whether that variable is a confounder or a risk factor, and then you can adjust for it. Otherwise, if that variable has a different role, probably you should think more judiciously about whether to adjust for that in your analysis. Um, so the general, difference between the TMLE framework and the other framework is that, say for example, when you are running a logistic regression or a linear regression or, or any other uh, machine learning method such as this XG boost or lasso or whatever you are running, what it does is basically you have a outcome variable and everything else uh, is basically, uh, considered as um, input variables. So there is no distinction between this uh, age variable with this RHC variable. But in, in causal inference, what we are primarily interested about is the relationship between RHC to Y, whereas in the general parametric regression as well as in general uh, machine learning methods, this RHC is no different than any other covariate that you are entering in the regression or the machine learning methods. Whereas 
when you are dealing with a uh, TMLE type of method, what it does, it, it, it uses the outcome modeling, the Q um, predictions, and it also deals with the exposure modeling using the G predictions. And there is the extra targeting steps from, from which you can get uh, this RHC uh, slightly in a different scale or the, in a different form uh, compared to all of the other covariates that you have. So that is why it is very useful for uh, someone who is interested in causal inference and primarily the relationship between an exposure and an outcome variable to use this type of TMD type of framework to get a better understanding of what is the relationship and how all the other variables are just background variables. Uh, uh, we are just adjusting for them, uh, but primarily we are interested in the relationship between this um, exposure variable and this outcome variable. Um, and, and also uh, the reason why someone would consider SL or the super learning method is that in general, as you have seen in our examples as well, that when you use different prediction methods, different prediction methods tend to give you different predictions. Uh, and generally that impacts your treatment effect estimate. Uh, instead of just relying on one method, what super learning is basically doing is relying on many different methods. And that is why it is highly encouraged to choose as different um, learners as possible in your candidate list so that you can get a diverse list of uh, predictions from which you can get a, a linear combination of uh, the ensemble super learner prediction uh, so that you can get a more stable version of the treatment effect estimate. All right, and the last point I just want to make quickly is that just because the origin of the TMLE method was in the causal inference literature does not necessarily mean that just because you have used TMLE, you get causal inference of the treatment effect estimate. The to, to get treatment effect estimate a causal interpretation, there are a couple of assumptions that you need to satisfy. And when I talk about assumptions, it does not mean that I just wish those assumptions were true. I talk to subject area experts to check or figure out whether these assumptions are plausible in the type of data that I'm dealing with. So for example, something like conditional exchangeability, positivity and consistency. These are some of these assumptions that uh, we can um, talk with the subject area expert to get a sense of whether these assumptions are being satisfied. Something like conditional exchangeability and consistency are something that you cannot necessarily test from your data. Positivity to some extent you can, uh, but say, for example, something like consistency, whether your treatment is well-defined or not, you have to talk with the subject area experts to get a good sense of um, whether um, there is a consensus, consensus or agreement within the experts about that. In terms of this particular workshop, as you have seen, the focus was on purely implementation, and we have just showed a uh, data analysis through different steps of TMLE as well as some of the related methods such as IPW as well as G competition methods. Uh, but there are a lot of theory behind it and we did not really uh, cover those topics within this three hour workshop. Uh, and if you want to get a better understanding of these methods after this workshop, there are some key articles I recommend and some of these articles we have used uh, to build this uh, tutorials that we have built. Um, so I, I would highly recommend to read at least one of these two and one of these two to understand better about super learning and TMLE. If you want to learn more, there are some additional references that I have listed that will be very useful for you to understand why um, this type of TMLE methods uh, are useful and how they are derived and all of the relevant uh, information if you are more interested about more workshops like this, about TMLE, there are a couple of workshops in the Society of Epidemiologic Research and um, in the University of Washington, um, you could try to join them. Uh, but if you want to take a look at some of the free resources that you have on YouTube, there are actually a number of very good resources within YouTube that are all coming from the group of uh, Wenderland and some of the colleagues 
Um, and you can see some of these introductory materials, some of the more 2D type of materials, uh, some applied talks, and there are also some of the blogs that are very helpful in explaining some of the ideas of KMD and super learning. And at the end of this, um, you also have a list of references that we have uh, given. Um, you can also look into them, but generally speaking, these references are cited within the tutorial as well. So with that in mind, I think this is the end of our workshop, uh, but I'm happy to take any questions from the audience. Uh, you can type it in the chat box if there is any question. Oh, you are very welcome. Thank you. Thank you for bearing with us for the last three hours. All right, so if we do not have any other questions, then uh, this is the end of the discussion, uh, but you have the materials, those materials will be live and if you uh, have any questions um, after reading the, the materials or revising the materials, uh, you can always reach us. All of the contact details uh, should be in the front page of that tutorial that we have just shared. Thank you very much. And I will just stop the recording and um, stop the session now. Thank you.